All right, commissioners, that brings us to 6A, presentation on differential growth patterns in the Austin metropolitan status areas. We have tonight, our pleasure, we have uh, Mr. Robinson to present. Good evening to you. Thank you very much. I am Ryan Robinson. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. Um, and not that it necessarily matters, my opinion, but I consider this one of our pillar commissions. Um, to me, the environment is part of the city's zeitgeist. It's, 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 it's why we, we are who we are. Um, and I, and, I, and I hope, that, I hope that, that everyone who's currently here realizes just how important the environment has been to, uh, to our history and of where we've come. And I'm, every, every now and then I get a little worried about that. So anyway, thanks very much for having me. This is a topic that, that I've been working on, and my office has been working on for a couple of years. So it, it's, it's work that I had, and I'm very happy to, to, to bring it to you. Uh, my sense is that we're, 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 we're in a period where Metropolitan Austin is becoming more and more an organic, integral part of an urban cluster that's emerging across Central Texas. And so I think at the city, we often think of that polygon as being everything. And I think that this is a good example of where I'm going to have an opportunity to show and demonstrate how we're part of this bigger, organic, urban, urban creature that evolves every year. Um, I'm going to touch on these uh, topics, population growth, shifting shares, household dynamics, income landscapes, I think that's part of it, and the role of housing. So um, this is just a simple look at state-level growth, and, and I think it's important to point out that 20% of total population growth for the entire U.S. from 2010 to 2018 occurred in Texas. Um, and so, yes, we're still the second largest state, but we're obviously um, grabbing, uh, you could call that the lion's share. We, Texas might stand to gain four congressional seats. But I think it's important that all of that growth, that 3.55 million person increase, is highly concentrated across the state's urban areas. And you can see those you know, you can see the big metro areas come, come screaming out. Every time I make this map, I'm always, um, I don't know, if it's surprised at how many counties in Texas continue to experience population loss. Um, and, and so the, the, the growth in Texas is an urban growth, um, plus suburban expansion. But in terms of absolute numbers, that big gain is happening in the urban counties. So this is absolute growth. I'll show you the version of uh, percent, excuse me, percent gain. And that, of course, pulls those suburban counties out. I have apologize. I've taken the liberty of coloring the Gulf of Mexico, sort of a strange, not found in nature color. But that's simply so that we can see those coastal counties in Metro Houston uh, show up. Um, maybe one thing to, to mention is you can see the counties in West Texas around uh, Midland and Odessa and El Paso. In terms of percent gain, there's a lot of growth and activity. but. Keep in mind that that's not, it pales in comparison to the absolute growth that you're seeing in the big cities. All right, and that's just a, a breakout of the big growth uh, uh, counties. I think it's just beyond impressive that Harris County has grown by over half, um, half a million persons. And, and you can even combine the growth in Dallas and Tarrant, and it still doesn't quite equal that, Harris County. There's, of course, Travis, Williamson, and Hayes. And I'll even, not that Comal is in our MSA, but Comal is in this uh, strip of counties that I'm about to show you. Um, that, so I think that's an impressive representation of uh, metropolitan Austin in that collection of big growth Texas counties. So I'm going to go through a series of zip code uh, growth and decline maps. And, and before I put zip codes on there, I just want to kind of show the county outlines. And I'm going to focus on the I-35 corridor. And you can see Bear County in the, in the lower left-hand side and, and, and uh, Williamson, Bell, and Milam in the upper right-hand side. And so I'm going to show you growth and decline from 2010 to, to 2017. 2017, because that's the last, it's the most recently available American Community Survey data. Um, and I think it's worth mentioning that it, when, you, when you get ACS survey data for small areas, something below a county or a city, it's actually a five-year composite because the sample size is so small. What that means for us is that where you see high growth, the ACS five-year data is inherently lagged. And so it's even greater. But we won't know that until we get an actual count from uh, 2020. But with that as a caveat, I think this map is descriptive. And it's the kind of thing that just, you know, it, it, it was a lot of fun to make. Because when, when you make that, you really get a sense of, 
of how much growth is occurring in Central Texas. And it's, of course, patterned uh, along that I-35 corridor. You see Bell, Bell County in the north, that's Fort Hood. Come down to Williamson. Um, and even the, 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 the zip codes that show decline, they're not deep declines, but I think Burnett County is worth looking at because a lot of us want the Census Bureau to include Burnett County in our MSA and make it a six-county MSA. Campo is already including them in their modeling. I think that's appropriate. But you can see that it's the southern part of that county that's growing, and that's Marble Falls that's suburbanizing, and, and those folks are driving in to jobs in the, in the, uh, in the, in the employment core, where Burnett itself in the north part in the northwest county is actually in decline, and, and, and so I, I find that interesting. Look at Hayes and Comal counties. I mean, I think that they, while I always would have predicted, and you dig up our old forecast, we always thought they would grow, but I don't think anyone would have predicted how much growth they're, they're uh, uh, experiencing now. And to me, that's a function of the two big metropolitan areas of Austin and San Antonio. After so long of almost sort of ignoring each other, they're kind of starting to look at each other and, and interact with each other. Um, I probably said it too often, but my heart was broken when Lone Star Rail was taken off the table because, wow, what a brilliant way to truly stitch the regions together with, with high capacity rail or even just rapid rail, whatever you want to call it. But I mean, imagine the thrill of getting on a train and 45 or 50 minutes later, you know, pulling into uh, to San Antonio. So um, maybe, you know, who knows, maybe we can get that back going. Maybe when we pass an ambitious rail program in 2020, everyone will, will, uh, will catch the drift and, and, and expand it. So we'll see. So I'm going to zoom in a little bit on the Austin MSA, and we'll get a better look at that. I've got the zip codes identified. The growth in, in, in northern Hayes County just is stunning. Um, and you can see the, the, the Cedar Park Leander sort of 183 corridor. You can see northeastern parts of, of, of Travis County. They're growing just extremely uh, rapidly in terms of big tonnage. And again, by the nature of the five-year composite data, we know that the high growth areas are low-balled in terms of actual how much growth is occurring there. So let's zoom in even, even further, and that's kind of, you know, my zoomed-in shot of, of Travis, and you can see the, I've kind of put names on those, and I've, I've, I have shifted from zip codes to census tracts because of the greater specificity. And this is a map that, you know, I, I would kind of expect it to look like, with some parts of town showing some decline, not, not deep declines, and then other parts of town showing that, the, 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 the big gain. And again, I'm quick to say we just won't know for sure until we get the actual count from 2020. Um, and I think it's worthy of mention that that 2020 count is in jeopardy because of underfunding of that effort and then the inclusion of a citizenship question. We have not asked citizenship of every household in this country since 1950 when the foreign-born share of total was about 4.5%. Foreign-born share of total now is almost up to our high of 1910. It's, it hovers at the at national level about 15%. It... It, it, it maybe it's, it's kind of down in the weeds, but I, but I think it's worth, I just can't talk about population growth in the decennial without mentioning the um, potential catastrophic nature of asking citizenship. Um, it would, it's, it's very, very difficult to get everyone to participate in a, in a decennial census anyway, but there's an environment of fear directed at our non-citizens, which the Constitution clearly says count everybody. Anyway, I'm just kind of, I, I'm just kind of putting that up as sort of this you know, I'm, 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 I'm hopeful that, that it will be taken off. We won't know until uh, maybe a month or two when the Supreme Court, I think, will do the right thing and strike it down. All right, let's look at shifting shares. The next couple of graphs, I could almost they'd be my takeaway graphs. But I'm taking the, the, the total growth for the Austin metro area, that five county, I'm looking at it from 2010 to 2011, and I'm dealing it into showing you where it went by county, and then comparing that to 2016, 2017, and I think, you know, the, the big takeaway is that Travis County went from having the lion's share of that growth, and that market share was then distributed to Williamson and, and Hayes and, and uh, to a lesser extent Cal Caldwell and Bastrop. But again, the, 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 the Williamson County portion doesn't surprise us, but it's the Hayes County share that I think is, is, is really pretty stunning. And then I'm going to do the same sort of thing, but for the city. Um, and I think maybe it was this graph that, that, that got me invited to the commission, and I appreciate that. But it, the top shows the, 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 the total growth annual increment for the MSA. And to my eye, that's pretty flat. I mean, there's some variation, but certainly for the last uh, four years, that's been pretty steady. But look what's happening to the city's take of that pretty flat growth. It's, it's declining. It's, it's dropped to 23%. We're going to have new data points, and I'll be able to 
push this graph forward to 2017, 2018, we're going to have a new metro data point next week and then a new city data point from the Bureau about four, four weeks from now. I think that 23% will drop to about 18. Um, and, the, and the simple reason, not, not that it's simple, but I would point to the, the, the largest explanatory variable in my mind is that housing within the city of Austin has become more expensive than it has ever been. And it is re that, the expense of that housing is really beginning to push households around the region in a way that it has not in the past. And so simply, let's just to close that piece of it, is that the city's not share of growth, but the city's share of the total MSA is at 44%, but is, uh, is dropping. And that's, that's not unusual. I think this, that the city has been um, really successful at hanging on to its share. When you look at other big American uh, uh, urban, urban clusters, the central cities have not been as durable in, in, in holding on to that. There are a couple of theories out there called, uh, they, they state that the American city is uh, becoming inverted. Uh, I think a book written in 2012, The, the Great American Inversion, and it's, it's the inversion that they're referring to is that the urban core will become where you have clusters of affluent households and the suburbs will be where you have lower income households. So it's a little bit more like a European model. It's a, it's a Parisian uh, model. You could make the argument that Austin is beginning to follow those steps, depending on how you define inversion. Um, but let's look at population growth rates. This is, uh, this is back in from 2011 to 2012. The city of Austin had a growth rate of 3.1%. It was the fastest growing large city in the, in the country. We held that distinction for five years. I remember saying, boy, I wish that we would lose that distinction. I think that being the fastest growing city in the country year after year is maybe a bit of a dubious honor. I mean, it says, wow, we're fantastic. <laughs> but it's a level of growth that's just really unmanageable. So I'm going to fast forward to uh, 2016, 2020, 2017. I'm going to keep the scale the same, and you can see something interesting, that not only did Austin's growth drop, but look at how the, that, that set of large cities, they all pulled back in terms of their growth share. And that, to me, is a clear indication that growth has moved out into the suburbs, not just in Austin, but across the United States. Um, and so even at, you know, even at 1.3%, that's an 18,000 gain. It, 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 it's still significant. You can see Seattle at the very top, uh, Fort Worth, Charlotte, um, uh, San Antonio, which is, again, is, is, is relatively new. San Antonio has not been a high-growth city until this decade. But let's look at the metro, and there's, there's Metro Austin back in from 2011 to 2012, and it was the fastest-growing large metro. Latest data, it's still the fast growing. So that's part of this narrative, is that is the Austin metro continues to be the fastest growing large metro, but the city within it has really beginning, it, it is, uh, has, has, has taken back a couple of steps. And it, it, it's, it's funny, I mean, in a way, I think that's positive, except for the fact that I think it's a manifestation of something negative. It's a, it's a manifestation of something that's out of our control, and that's, and, and that's the, the price of housing. Um, and there are lots of people who will offer up a fix. I mean, to me, the main thing we have to go for is we have to have a more flexible land development code that can allow a greater diversity of housing. And, and, and to me, that's kind of the condensed, you know, it's, it, it's, it's about diversity of housing type. We're not going to be a successful city going forward if we just have single family and just have monster garden uh, apartment complexes with 350 units in it. You've got to have something in between. I call it attached housing. I think that we are... We're okay on duplexes, but we're really light on the three, four, five, six unit. That attached housing that you see in the Northeast, you see in parts of California, that to me is the answer. But we'll see, we'll see what we're able to do going forward. Um, a couple of things, I'll talk about household dynamics. The next set of slides, I think, to me, drives home the point that Austin has become a significantly more affluent city in just a short period of time. So now, I'm not controlling for inflation. It would, it would bend this a little bit, but not significantly, I would argue. So go back to Census 2000, and you see that 19% of our families made $100,000 or more. Take that to 2017, and 44% of our families now make $100,000 $100, or more. So not only is that a huge increase in share, but of course, let's put underneath that the growth in absolute terms and you've got a whole lot more affluent families in, in, in the city now than you used to. And families in this category is simply two or more people related by birth or, or marriage or adoption. It's not necessarily families, families with children. It's, it, it's just the overall category of families. Um, and so let's map it, all right, because that's, that's what we do. Here's a, here's a map of median family income from 2011. I'm going to do kind of a little slide progression thing where I'm going to bounce to 2017. It's kind of a visual. I'll go back again. 
do it one more time and I'll stop. You know, I see, a, I see, I see the eastern expansion of that big, that big blue blob. You also see two census tracts that have uh, household income below $20,000. I mean, and, and back to those graphs where I showed you where the, the, the shift in share, in order to have that kind of increase in affluence, you have to have two things happening. You have to have the in-migration of high-income households, and you have to have the out-migration of low-income households or displacement. You wouldn't have that <coughs> profound of a change unless you had both of those dynamics happen. So, again, you know, cartographically, this is kind of my way of, of partially explaining how, how growth has shifted. Let's talk more about the role of housing. Um, uh, this is a relatively simple way to compare the, the price of housing and, and the ability to pay for it. Um, median family income on the bottom, median ho housing on, on the top. To me, it, it's, it's not so much that, I guess I, I, would, I would admit that I want our housing to increase in value, but not at that slope. It's the steepness of the slope that is causing so much discomfort and driving so much displacement. Um, I can't think of a situation where the steepness of that slope would be something that could be accommodated or would be considered a, a, a healthy thing in an urban sense. And yet, we still have relatively affordable housing compared to our peer cities. And the dynamic where we're creating jobs at still about a three to three and a half percent rate and those jobs are, are well-paid, high-tech jobs where we're importing the majority of that talent from these more expensive markets. While well, I look at San Francisco there, the median north of a million, we're going to still be facing this notion of the double-edged sword of housing for local Austinites is insanely expensive, but from a national level, it will continue to be relatively affordable. Now, that's for sale product. This is the rental product. We're a more expensive rental market than we are a for sale product. But I keep my eye on Denver. The year that we're above Denver is going to make me truly worried. Colorado, as you guys know, has got a state income tax. Housing in Denver is more expensive, but their property tax burden is way below ours. And that'd be interesting. You know, if that's of interest to you, we can dig up data and show that. But I think that's kind of a good comparison for me, at least. Um, and then I'm going to close with city employees as one example. I did a series of maps for the folks who operate our <coughs> van pool system. So this is by zip code concentrations of city employees uh, in 2015. I got a new data set for 2019. Again, I'll do that toggle. You can see the growth in, in, in northern Hayes County and uh, in, in, in parts of Travis County. And then I went to the trouble to do an actual change map. And to me, granted, the, the, the red and the, and, the, and, the, and the oranges and yellow show a decrease. Some of that can be explained by the fact that we did move city offices. But I think the greater explanatory variable here is the fact that city employees are a good example of a middle-class workforce that is highly affected by the price of housing. And so to see that kind of shift in just not quite four years, I think, is telling. Um, and a, a few final comments. The greater Austin metropolitan region continues to grow rapidly and evolve into a multi-nucleated urban organism. City of Austin's share of regional growth has reached an all-time low and will probably continue to fall. We'll have those numbers within a month. Um, I'd be elated to see that turn back around, but as a statistician, that's called a non-monotonic trend, and those are rare. Um, it's hard for it to change direction once it kind of gets going. And then third, Metropolitan Austin is a dynamic, organic piece of the greater set of urban clusters emerging across Central Texas. And, and, and for me as a geographer, that is kind of, you know, that's sort of my, my, my solace, is that yes, we're seeing a lot of change, but we're playing a role in this bigger production that's happening across the state. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's a, a valid thing for us to, to point out. So I'm open, uh, available for, for questions um, and uh, comments. But that's my presentation. All right, we'll start down here with Commissioner Smith. Well, you just threw a lot of numbers at us <laughs> real yeah, fast. Yeah, that was it's, fast. It's, it was fascinating, though, and I'd love to get a copy of the, Absolutely. the PowerPoint mm -hmm. or any other particular report that in includes that. But uh, yeah, I guess key question I have is, is you're absorbing all these numbers and uh, how much are you looking at? What environmental <laughs> issues do you think are outstanding from the numbers that you're seeing? What should we as environmental commission well, I, I think, be looking forward to? Yeah, I'm, you know, and that's, of course, we've got experts in the room, but I was looking at my colleague's Salander presentation uh, over the corner, and, and, you know, that Barton Springs zone is sitting in North, northern Hayes County, and it's it's experiencing so much growth that that would be a concern for me. I'm a 
a huge fan of Barton Springs. I mean, I, I think that truly is kind of, you know, one of our gems. And, and, and if something were to ever happen to that, um, I think we would, we would suffer for it. So I think that it just the sheer population growth as it, as it, as it, as it sorts itself out across the aquifer, um, you know, and back in the day we had the drinking water protection zone, um, which actually was a little bit of a stretch, but you know, we, we, we knew it, but that's what we wanted to call it. And, uh, and that was branding on our part. So that's where my simple mind goes, but it's, it's, it's so over my head. Um, uh, but that's, I mean, I, I guess your sort of main department is watershed protection. And I think that it, it's one of my favorite departments. It's full of really smart scientists. Um, and I have been invited to a follow-up presentation by, uh, by Matt Holland to his policy and planning group. So maybe I'll have a better sense of, uh, of how to answer your question after I meet with those folks. But I would bet that, that, that Matt or, or Chris could, uh, could, could, could probably feel that more effectively than I could. Mm -hmm. yeah, well, it's interesting you mentioned Hayes County and how it is tied in ultimately to Barton Springs because more and more studies are done. We're seeing how tied in even Blanco River, you know, out yeah. to Wimberley and all that area is ultimately to Barton Springs. So, yeah. yeah, thank you. Yes, sir. Commissioner Crew, Commissioner Smith. Um, thank you for coming. This is yeah, a, a great, I've heard this before and I was the one that requested you come here. Cool. So I appreciate it. The one thing I had seen in your previous discussions is we, we keep talking about our population doubling in 20 years. Not the city. Um, that's, right, in the region. But it's been, it's been doubling every 20 years for quite some time. Absolutely. Um, in fact, going back to like 1860, I believe. It's crazy. Yeah, certainly. We, certainly, in, you slice it a little differently, but it, since the early 1900s. Okay. So it's really not a recent growth pattern. It's kind of the same growth pattern we've been seeing for well over 100 years. Yes, sir. And that's, I think, I think and it's because of our environment. I mean, right. to me, our environment is one of the foundational growth factors that is driving this. Commissioner Maceo. Commissioner Thompson. Um, I like the way um, you put the housing, uh, the monetary values and the housing and the numbers <coughs> and everything. But it would be interesting to see like water use and how that has um, affected. Like, as in residential water use? Well, as in the water that we have and the use that is being, um, I don't know, for each city, for the availability, and so forth, and the sort. I know Water Forward is doing a lot of that, but I'm, I mean, since you did these numbers so well, I just thought it might be interesting. No, that's a fascinating idea. If the, you uh, could do that, because that is one of the main things that I think affects the price of the housing and the quality of life of the people here. So. I agree. And I was involved with Joe Smith and, 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 and the gang over at uh, Austin Water doing that uh, water forward. And I learned a lot about that, you know, because my forecasting window is usually so much shorter than that. And we were asked some really good questions. You know, what <clears throat> long term, what kind of density could, could Austin actually uh, achieve and what would the water needs be, be for that? And, and yet we only did it for our jurisdiction. It'd be fabulous to have that same type of data for everybody uh, around us. Um, and so I'll talk to uh, Joe Smith at Austin Water and we'll see what we can do. Because, you know, they may not have as much data as we have, but I bet we could do a comparison. Thank you. Yes. Um, just a few comments. One, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. It seems as if you are talking about those attached houses that we're not, we're not getting that. My interpretation is that we're building for... Um, not the people that make minimum wage. We're not building for the people that are middle class. And so I'd love to see some more information regarding those attached houses you referred to, if, if there's any kind of models or information you could send. Yeah, you no, know, I'll, I'll, I'll look around. I think that I, think that I can. It, one, of the, one of the points that, be, that to me became a, a dominant point toward the end of Code Next was, was this very notion that why, why are we seeing so much high-end stock built when a house is knocked down, because that's where the demand is. That's not that there's not demand across the income spectrum, but from the developer standpoint, from an opportunistic, you know, make the most bang for your buck, they're gonna they're gonna demolish the house in Crestview and, and build two six hundred thousand dollar houses right next to each other. Um, 
but let me dig into the uh, attached housing piece. I mean, that's, I think, what folks were calling missing middle, um, mm -hmm. and that's, that's an okay term. I know that maybe it's kind of freighted with a pejorative, so I, I go, I just want to talk about the units themselves because I don't want that to get in my way. But um, I think the, the, the challenge for the city is, at the same time, open it up and yet try and direct where that capacity is. In my opinion, we have, a, we have plenty of overall housing capacity. It's just in the wrong place and it's the wrong type. And so fixing that is a hard, it, it sounds simple, but it's very difficult to do because you're so many factors to go. But, but let me dig and I'll, uh, yeah. I'll, I'll provide Because those, can. the people that are moving out are creating the traffic coming in. Absolutely. And we're not resolving anything. No, and, and, and then to, not to jump around, but to me the ultimate fix is high capacity transit. Right? I mean, how does greater New York work? You have huge income inequality. You have, it's not physically that much bigger than we are actually but it works because they have high capacity transit. You can, you can work it as best you can on housing policy, but without the transit piece, you're only gonna get so far. Great. I have a question. All right, you Commissioner um, Someone recently sent me some statistics that said that the people surveyed, 80, more than 80% of them, or maybe even been 85, said that they preferred to live in a house with a yard and the majority of those people said they wish to own it. So I would like to hear your comments on how you think Austin is addressing those, that data. Well, I, I, I think it, I mean, what I, what I would say is that it, it goes back to you want to try and be a city for everyone, and that means a diversity of housing. It, it, but it's, it, it's, this, it's this clustering phenomenon that's so, that's so hard to, uh, to, to, to deal with. Um, but maybe I'm not clearly understanding your question, Commissioner. I, mean, I, I apologize. Just your, I just wanted your comment on the, you know, we have these huge numbers of people not only going into the suburbs, what everyone refers to as sprawl, as sprawl, but also that's where people are getting what they want, which is a house with a yard, which they can't afford in Austin. Yeah, I mean, I think to, to my mind, and, I, and I've seen data like that, I, I, I think that that, I don't necessarily believe it. I mean, I think that people want a greater variety. Um, there certainly is a segment that they want a single family house and they want a yard and a lemon tree and that, and that, that whole notion, but that's not everybody. Um, you know, as a demographer, I'm watching the millennial generation and, and waiting for them to start to have children. <laughs> not, not my own millennials, not quite yet. Um, but I think that that will be telling because that generation is willing to trade the single family house and the yard for being in the urban environment and they're willing to maybe give up a car because they're in a transit rich zone or they're, so I, I think that that might be true of older uh, households, but I, I don't really buy that everyone wants a single family house in a yard in a, in a diverse growing metropolitan region like Austin. Some surely do, but I, I, I would reject the notion that that's even overwhelmingly the, the majority. Um, that kind of sounds to me like something the you know Realtors Association would send around just to sort of reify. Yep, we're selling single-family houses. You know, it's like, but send that to me and I can maybe put a critical eye on it. Okay. And, uh, but I, I, I think the I think the future, in, in, especially in terms of affordability, is all about type diversity in terms of housing. But thank you all very much for having me. Thank you so thank you. much. We really appreciate it.